Okay. And hello, um, this is Newt Newport from D1 Games. And today on the Infinite R RPG um, Roadshow, I'm talking to John Hudson from Handiwork Games. Um, hello. Hello, John. And John, um, I've known for many, many years, um, but I'm, of course, oh God, it's it's 30 yeah, odd years. Don't count them. Yeah, don't ah! count them. That's the secret, isn't it? Just say a really long time. A really long time. There's no yeah. way we're that old. Bit before, be almost years. before the internet, you know. Yeah. yeah. It was. Oh. I reckon when I met you, my internet came through cable TV and I had to type with a, with a remote on the TV. I think I had NTL cable internet. No. And I had email through yeah. that. We, but we met in Leeds where I, I, well, I was a post student. I was just, uh, I think by that time, I, I was uh, the first of many civil service jobs and John was working at Travelling Man. I was working as a waitress in a cocktail bar. No, I was working <laughs> selling comics. Yeah, I was selling comics. In a, but in a but I always bar. I but but John was also always the um, the stand-in for the RPG specialist who who um, yeah who is Matt about. I, I want to know if the latest RPG thing I'm after and uh, yeah. Matt was hiding around a corner. <laughs> Do you know, whatever. it's really nice that I'm still in touch with Matt. I'm still in touch with everyone I worked with there, actually, when I think about it. But yeah, no, it's nice to see, I see Matt on Facebook. He's a good lad. I do. He, he does some love, and he does lovely photos. Of he it. certainly does. Matt Bird's all photography. Matt. Let's give him a shout yeah. out. Go and check out his stuff on some awesome... <laughs> put, put, put a link in the YouTube video. Yeah, link in the description. Hit the bell, like, subscribe. Yeah, yeah. all that. So, 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 um, so, yeah, you... So I think I met you there. Mm. I saw your perky feet feature. The rest I, I, used, I, used, to, I used to call you the, the traveling man gnomes. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Well, well, it was in response to um, I forget, was it who was it when someone one of your team went off to Japan. Yeah, that'd be Andy. And he came back, and there was suddenly we're a workers' cooperative. Steve came. Steve <laughs> Emmett came up. We're a workers' cooperative now. We've got Andy's all these ideas from Japan. Yeah. How I'll nice. run it, and I, I said. Oh, I thought you were just a load of Nabil's gnomes. Nabil's gnomes, <laughs> and and, you, and, and yeah, you, you got I got the same reaction as your face is showing to me now. <laughs> Not very impressed. <laughs> it was nice. I, it was but nice I was I was well gnome. into sort of like I inappropriate sarcastic humour in those yeah. days, and and uh, um, I'm less so you, now. You and I'm everybody married. else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you and all the other customers. It was yeah. quite. It was a trial. Let me tell you. Hats okay, off to I, the retail workers. Goodness well, me. I, I I I kind of realised I was getting older. So fast forward, <laughs> yeah, a little bit because I lost touch with you after mm. I moved to Manchester. Yeah. Um, I just I just assumed you were going to work work in a comic shop forever. Uh, yeah, obviously, <laughs> as you do. Because um, and well, you're also comfortable there, so you know I, I didn't. Oh, that's good. I've got a lovely job, so. Yeah, I'm well, not saying that further. But I moved to Manchester. I got a job. Um, I got a job with uh, the university there, um, working in IT. Um, and I would then go to the Manchester Travelling Man job. And this is where I kind of realised I was getting old. I was now in my 40s. It's the early 2000s. Um, and I was getting a bit serious with D101 Games. And I was working on um, Monkey, the first edition that. And I went to, was a regular uh, Travelling Man Manchester. So Travelling Man has, at this stage, not just Leeds, it has, I think, Manchester, and I think Nottingham and Bristol were hanging on by a thread at this stage. Mm. They kind of, like, atrophied and, and went away. But the Manchester stop, stop which is still there, um, mm -hmm. and I, I spoke to the uh, the chap, oh, I forget what, it, it, Adam, Adam. Oh, yeah, I remember. And, I, and he said that you, I said, oh, I've got this game, Monkey, yeah. I need a cover. And he said, mentioned you. He said, do, 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 yeah. do you know John Hodgson? He's do, he's an artist. He does, mm -hmm. he's does pack out support plates for so much. And I go, of course I know John. He's the guy who used to sort of sort up my RPGs. <laughs> when the RPGs. And and uh, yeah, so that's why I contacted you, and and you did the first monkey cover, which is about to become um, the cover for um, the Monkey Companion. So nice. that cover's got to get. Yeah, it, it lives. 
it's a lovely piece of monkey um, on his, on his cloud floating away. I, I, but, I always, do you know, I always have to resist the temptation to go. Oh, listen, I'll just repaint that for you because you know it's it's you know it's been around for a while. But God, as no, if I have time to do that. No, don't. It's it's it's. it's I'll just it's do perfect. this. It's perfect. It really yeah. is sort of like. Well, it would it would make it it. different, wouldn't it? And it's it is what it is. Anyway, yeah. But uh, anyway, I was, I was going to the Manchester one, mm. and they got a sofa in. For some reason, right. and 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 I was like, but I can't I can't. Have you got the latest book? Book, and they they had no idea because they were sort more into the comics. So yep. I was, and uh, as, uh, I hear I hear it's it's coming from China, and they sort of, it became a bit of a joke that if I came in, and they had no idea. Oh, it's on the boat from China. It's on the boat, yeah. and and it was and it was. Like, Wouldn't you like to sit on the settee? And I was just like, no. No, I wouldn't want to sit on settee. You're meant to be working and stuff. I'm, I'm here on a work for, for proper work. Oh. <laughs> and I and I saw and I saw that and that's when I realised, yeah, I used to goof around, be daft, and 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 I was all part of the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, now you might not have felt that that was part of the experience, <laughs> but but that I I certainly felt that you know it. And you see that when I'm when I work trade shows, I have to remember that people. They come along, they crack on, they, they, they tell daft jokes, they they make up stories about why your book's late or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and 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 eventually, okay, you've had your 10 minutes. Are, are you gonna buy something or are you moving on? <laughs> yeah. Gonna close them sales. Yeah. Always be closing. Oh god, yeah. But uh so so I think so as I say, when I met met John, when we got 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 the cover to do monkey done. I was very much a um, writer. Nobody, nobody would publish my stuff. Um, I was heavily involved in Glamp from Fandom at the time. And Monkey was the game where I just thought, there's nothing else like it. And yeah, I had no contacts in publishing and um, you know, other games companies. I'm not even sure they really existed then. Indie game publishing was becoming a thing. Um, Ludo Comfort. Thing. So I was self-publishing, but I considered myself very much a writer. And John, um, John, then went, after the monkey cover, you did lots more of my open quest covers. In fact, to the point where yeah. you're the only person you do my covers. <laughs> it's funny because I I was looking the other day. We we've recently um, extended our house so we could move my in-laws in, and uh, I I ended up putting all I moved office. So I've got a sort of an actual dedicated home office now uh, not home office garden office building now and then, uh, so i had to pack up all my sort of comp copies from 20 years of, of working and you've put out a lot of books and i've done a lot of the covers of them yeah <laughs> it was great you go oh it's no wonder. i always say this it's like no wonder i'm tired like you look at this it, like i've done more covers for d101 games than than i can remember you know that's that was Love, when i when know, i released great. open quest third edition last year not only was it a big thing in terms of i did a proper print run i had a pallet of books in my drive yeah. go look at the blog it's the pictures of that uh, and it was a big piece of work but i hit looked at the stock number i gave it and it was d101 060 mm. and yeah. it kind of vibed with um the fact that i was 50 last year and i've been doing it roughly just over 10 years i think it's about 10 mm. or 12 now could be 13 uh and uh, oh no no no! It's fifteen years this 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 wow. some, some early summer, and yeah, I've started doing a blog posts uh, about each release and sort of the making of them. Yeah, yeah, you were my go. You are my go to. So I'd say about eighty percent, eighty percent of the covers. Oh, that's nice. I've enjoyed it. It's good. Yeah, I know. I've always liked the fact that you were like actually doing stuff because again. If you if you come up like I did through sort of working in a games and comic shop and and you meet a lot of people who who want to be something that they're not at the moment you know and that was very much me as well you know I, people sort of say oh what do you do and it'd be like well I, you know I work in a shop right now but but I don't feel that's sort of who I am or, or what mm. I I'm here to do but but you can't really you know you. you you got to remain realistic about these things but um, th- there are people you meet who actually get stuff done and you are definitely one of those as is you know testament to the the that I've, I've made a sentence that doesn't work um but you know <laughs> that is born as born witness to there we go by by the sheer volume of titles you put out you know i i have no idea where that drive was coming from um to do it other than it, 
it's it's my passion and I've yeah, made right, it into yeah. some fun yeah. thing. But uh, growing up, I, 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 I never really found myself in the whole career thing. I didn't kind of take yeah. the whole sort of, I knew very early on, somehow I wanted to do role playing stuff. Mm. I think I was inspired by the, the early games workshop stuff. Um, and certainly when they were covering role playing was very DIY. Yeah, that people would and people could write into Right Dwarf and and they have stuff published and that seemed to dry up after over time when they started became more yeah, about their own game different direction didn't they? Uh, but even so there was still that opportunity and and um, I although I didn't pick up on it lots of people did during that ages period in Britain did lots of fa- fanzines mm. it was a big huge thing uh, yeah. and uh, but I didn't twig until I had a look back at my grandfather. Um, so some of our people, um, you know, they're, they, they're doctors because their dad, dad was a doctor or whatever. Mm. Uh, um, I, I did the computers thing because my dad was um, an engineer. So it kind of right. like puts up, yeah. pay past part of the mind. But the crazy art, artistic creativity thing of doing role playing games, where the heck's that come from? Well, my grandfather, um, you won't find very, very little on in the, in the internet, Ted Brook, a guy called Ted Brookoft. Uh, after the war, went and bit, he was a sculptor. He, when he demobbed, he, he when somebody liked his wood whittlings and paid for him to go to the Slade, which is a Brilliant, very prestigious yeah. art college in London. And he entered, ended up at Manchester, uh, Manchester Art College, which is now part of the Polytechnic, or, oh, sorry, that's all terminology. Is it Manchester Metropolitan University? And his, you can see his sculptures in various public places. His most yeah. famous piece are a trio of sheep. This is great. Trio sheep in, in, in a Castlefield Fort in Manchester. And he, they were the after the 52 Manchester, uh, Manchester Council today, a competition to do a sculpture to celebrate the peace of the, after the war. Mm. Um, and he didn't win. He was joint, yeah. but he was joint second. So they made it anyway. And somebody said, Ted, what sheep? What's that got to do with peace? And he went, well, sheep are peaceful, aren't they? Nice. And he liked doing animals. He had pieces yeah. in Chester, um, Chester Zoo at some stage, and apparently he, he paid for the vino enclosure bits of it. <laughs> it's like, nice one, Grandad. We would have liked some of that inheritance money, but <laughs> your mum had fallen out, way. But he, I used to go visit him lots, and I saw him at work. Mm. And his work, you know, it's I, I laugh at some of the artists, so, 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 so especially some of the... I won't say less robust ones. The ones they've done a few few scribbles for their, their gaming group. They, they have gone, yeah, that's nice. And they come to me and say, I'd like to do work for you. And I kind of, yeah. And it's a real, it's a real mixed blessing, is it? If you're the, the artist of your gaming group, it's like you, you do need that springboard to sort of, you know, to build your confidence and, and it's important, but also you step outside of that and and you're then you know you're swimming with bigger fish at that point you know well my grandfather as i said he had he had the chops he was a senior mm. art lecturer yeah but i got to see him and he, he had a small holding farm that he rented again so thanks okay. for the inheritance grandfather yeah. <laughs> and, and he had a studio his studio was a whole and um, barn an old barn mm. and, and i got and i said oh can i have a look at that you know me i to a nipper yeah. and he says i'll have to come with you <laughs> it's a bit dangerous in there. Nice. Is, is, is it got monsters? No, no, it's apes and life-size horses and elephants. And he had a wonderful uh, elephant piece that I said, oh, can, can I have that? And he was like, no, 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 I've got this commission. Somebody's paid for that. Um, but it, it was very rare that he actually did sell stuff. He kept mm. hold of a lot of stuff. Right. And he had this whole barn just in the darkness, just all these giant huge pieces. Because what wow. he did, he got huge pieces of wood. I remember he got a delivery of an oak tree, which was a good six foot of of mm. of, of the of the trunk of an oak, and this big flatbed lorry going beep 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 coming back up the drive, and him being sort of like the inner child is like hey, really happy, um, and I said, "What are you going to do with that?" Granddad? I'm going to sculpt it, and he would stand out in the yard with his chisels. Brilliant. And uh, I've got some pictures of which I'll I've, I've fit some of them up on the blog, but um, mm. and. But just that whole, me and John over the years, we've talked about artists and also making games. And uh, we kind of, um, and the work ethic. Mm. 
there's a lot we we have a we catch up on these people we, we we're not i'm not going to mention anybody now we, we before we had a bit of a chat and caught up with our latest gossip and i said we won't talk about the usual characters that we follow <laughs> we're not naming names but there is a tendency with all play you won't you know you'll know you'll know of john because he's got had an illustrious career um in in, in cubicle seven now doing how to work game and and uh, me well you know me because you've, you've clicked on the link or whatever uh, but I'm a, I'm a small, small publisher and uh, and very underneath the radar. I think a lot of people could say to me, oh, you do that? Oh, that is surprising, yes. Um, but he just, watching him work and the whole environment of him just getting on and doing the work. And there's lots of people, like me and John, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that the would love to do stuff and they replace the act of doing with the act of talking and, and yeah. yeah. Well, so, it's, that, it's that the year, if you want to be a writer, you've got to write, haven't you? If you want to be an artist, you've got to do art and there's no substitute for it. It's just, you've you know, got to graft. It's all, you've got all to graft stuff in my, my, my Lancashire grandfather, Ted would say. <laughs> yeah, but, there's uh, no way around it. So, so yeah. Um, so that's an, so that's kind of like, I, I worked it out, couple of years ago I had a bit of a soul search and yeah Ted's responsible and Ted's also responsible why imaginative storytelling because he let's say he had this whole small holding farm in just south of Manchester in a place called around a, in a hamlet uh, attached to a town called Knutsford which is famous for uh, its football football players Manchester United and Liverpool players live in the big big houses nearby um, but it's gorgeous gorgeous countryside I always remember getting there and it's like the Cotswolds you get there mm. and it's green and you know it's, it's like fairyland and I said one day I said to him as we we're looking over the fields and all the trees are twinkling it's a lovely so I said how do you grandma come to live here and he said well there's a story there <laughs> me and grandma we came over from, from Ireland in, in a covered wagon and they're oh all right and and how did you but how did you, so you got here by yeah, by, by wagon. Oh, that's good. Yes. And when we got here, there was a giant. There was a giant. Oh, and he's saber proof tooth, um, giant saber tooth um, cat. And I got out, jumped out of the wagon, and I killed the giant. Oh, what about his cat? Him too. Look over there, yonder there. And he pointed to this, this, this bit of dead wood that was like, like a, a big tusk from the side. And that's where I buried it. Wow. So, yeah, so there was all, and this is something that apparently he was a teller of tales. Um, and, but, but yeah, so remember I'm about five, but that got my imagination going and all the, the rest of it. So, so I've, I've diverted there. So, so I'm doing, going, flashing back to Ma 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 Manchester early, early on, um, and I'm doing Monkey. So at this um, stage, you were, were you still working for Traveling Man or? Oh, I think I would have possibly left Traveling Man by that. By that point. That, that's the bit I, I, I you, you, you moved up to Scotland with your, your, your wife or yeah, wife to yeah, me by that I'd, stage. Uh, the, uh, the relationship I was in in Leeds for a good few years, that had broken down and I needed somewhere to live. It was a bit alarming. I was really struggling to find somewhere to live and ended up uh, my best mate forever, a guy called Matt, who I met at school years and years ago. It just happened to be um, moving into a, a, a flat in Edinburgh and needed a lodger. Like they literally were looking right. for a lodger. So that that came together very, very nicely. So I just moved to Scotland. Um, and then like right. two weeks later, funny enough, met my now wife, um, which was all obviously very serendipitous that that all happened. But yeah, yeah, I'd been, uh, yeah, I'd left Travel Man. I was, I was freelance for quite a while in in Leeds, I think. And right moved around a bit, lived in workshop of all places for a while. My then partner, we tended to follow her job. Um, so yeah, yeah, I just sort of moved around. But yeah, I was freelancing for all sorts of, I mean, who was I working for? All kinds of people, AEG doing like Warlord card game, Legend of the Five Rings. Um, I was working for um, Games Workshop on Warhammer Historical. They were a really big client and I worked for them for a very long time. Um, I did all sorts, I did all the Dragon Warriors covers. They were pretty cool with them. Um, James Wallace's Magnum Opus Press. Um, looking looking back at those at the moment, actually, because that's been about fifteen years um, since that came out, and I'm looking to do a bit of a project to celebrate those. Oh, lovely! Eight yeah. covers we did for that, and it was good. It was a good time, and yeah, I've got some 
I'm just I'm just looking around in the back. Yeah, no. If, good, if you've not come across Dragon Warriors, uh, especially if you're one of our, my international listeners, mm. Dragon Warriors was a big um, game book, um, but instead of fighting fantasy sort of choose your own adventure types, it was nice during the 80s. It was a nice format, um, pay, trade paper format in all the all the big um, book shops. Uh, and John and, and, um, did the covers for the revitalized version in the early 2000s. Mm. Um, and that's what, that's the version he's talking about now. So it was a big, huge thing. I know John says he, he like, you said you like work on it because it's the first game he played. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's know, the first a lot, of, pe- a lot game, of people yeah. say, you know, that me too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny because it's, it's huge in, it was big in the UK. It was big in like Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Never really broke huge in the states. Some of the, I mean, there there's all sorts of stories. Dave Morris, who who wrote the the books with a guy called Oliver Johnson, he he tells loads of amazing stories about like they sent because it was released in a series of paperbacks. And when it was first released in the UK, they sent like all of number one to one end of the country and all of number two to the other end of the country initially. So, you know, which caused this really, really difficult supply problem. But he tells all the classic stories of, sort mm. of you know, that kind of time in publishing. Really good. But yeah, no, James, James Wallace picked it up, who who had been publishing uh, Wham Fancy Roleplay. And I'd worked on Wham Fancy Roleplay very briefly, only a small contribution to the um, Dwarfs book of, of like first edition. So I actually worked on, First edition, uh, second edition, and there's a lot of the artwork in third edition of of Worm Fancy World. Please actually just copied directly from second edition, which is weird because like the the agitator, I was my own model for the agitator um, <laughs> career, and then that was that was sort of copied into third edition by a completely different artist, which sort of made me laugh because it was me, you know. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then of course you know I ended up it, it, you know I'm I'm jumping miles ahead but I ended up like art directing and, and being creative director of that project for a while at um, Cubicle 7 where I ended up right. working so yeah so yeah no I was freelance for a really long time I mean I was freelance for a good 10 years and work, working for all sorts of companies I mean I worked on D&D and uh, you name it really it's like shocking the things I've worked on you've, you've um, done a lot of graft haven't you yeah I have people, people very much associate me these days with things like the One Ring. I mean, I think that's fading now. There's a new edition and and we're doing different stuff now, you know, Beowulf and stuff at Handbook yeah. Games. Um, but um, yeah, probably the One Ring I'm known most for. But I'd worked on D&D and all sorts before that. Because we go, oh, you know, this artwork looks like the One Ring, what have you? And like, well, no, it looked like some other things before that. But hey-ho, yeah. Yeah. So so as John, just to mm. summarise, John, John, when I first knew um freelancing and then you worked for qb circle seven and yeah and- i started doing covers for them and then and then they were looking for an art director um and i had just had kids at this point and needed well kid and and was looking for something a little bit more stable and i was certainly coming to the end of my tether really with freelancing because you know it's not very reliable income and I was working yeah. really hard and you don't always get paid and you start to, I was starting to really lose the connection between the work I was doing and the amount of money in my pocket. Cause you often have to wait a very long time to get paid and so on, or, or, you know, you don't get paid at all. So when I was offered a, a job at cubicle seven, um, yeah, I was keen to take it. And I was always grateful that you negotiated a, a clause in your contract that you could carry on doing freelancing. Yeah. Yeah. I was, so, I always so stayed during freelancing. this period, which yeah, was, coincided me having kids and, yeah. So we had we had a, we had a bit of a bloom. Um, what was going on? D one one all the time. The Open Quest two was big. Right. Okay. So you yeah. had a lot of covers for that, and yeah. it was, um, we, yeah, it was a kind of like, um, I hope. Um, well, it is it is back again. Um, mm. That sort of period, but but so you did the Cubicle Seven stuff, and now how how many years now? Though? Is it? It's probably getting on for a couple of years. So. You've yeah, we're, we're coming up to, and... yeah. So I, I was at Cubicle Seven for about nine years um, in in various job roles. I mean, I went from um, art director to like um, creative director and deputy CEO, um, and then eventually moved on. It was about three years ago now. We're coming up to about right. three years. Um, sat my own my own thing, Handiwork Games. Um, yeah, which has been really good actually. It's been really satisfying. Yeah, if, if, you, yeah. Sorry, if yeah. you've not worked, if you've not come across John's work. He he's got to, Beowulf is now completely out in the wild, so to speak. Yeah, um, and it's a glorious. I would call them. It's it's a it's a game. It's a very good game. Um, mm. It's 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 based. It's fifth edition, 
but it's based upon the, the first English novel. Um, um, so I almost played it with my, my son after he'd done it at school. Nice. Uh, a ton of stuff about Anglo-Saxon history. And the, one of the selling points is it's one-on-one. -on -one. So yep. even for everybody I know bought it, but I thought, well, I'll cat either play it with my, 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 my son or my daughter um, as, as one of their first RPGs, or I'll call, call us somebody who's looking a bit lost at some convention to say, do you want a game? And yep. We only need you, and if you want to bring your mate. What, what did you say? You say, does it sort of, is it, can it, can it accommodate more traditional science? Yeah, equipment? totally. We, we definitely built it so that you could, all the rules that kind of facilitate one-on-one -on -one play and the big the big deal there in fifth edition is sort of the action economy so that you're not um you don't become a victim to sort of say not having as many goes as it were as, as adversaries and things like that when it comes to stuff like combat um but all the rules we we've built to facilitate that they can all lift out and you can you can play it multiplayer um if you've got basically the the sort of secret source is the idea of having followers that your hero in in the mold of beowulf has has a bunch of followers they work a little bit like spells actually that they they sort of step into the spotlight do their thing that they do as a character and then they sort of retreat again into the spotlight uh out of the spotlight as it were um and, and you have a bunch of those following you and there's a little bit of tactics and how you use them and making sure you rest them up and stuff and uh, and can use their abilities again um but you can have a small a small number of those if you just got two players you can just they can be supported with a few followers um and uh, if you if you've got sort of four, typically typical four player party, you don't you don't need to use them at all. Right. And it, it works just the same. We haven't done an awful lot to combat or anything. There's like another that. another game I've got on my shelves, um, an OSR game, um, and I can't remember the name of it. And I can't even well, squinting. I can't see it. Um, it'll come to me in rather annoying mm. way. All right, I'll put I'll put a link on it. <laughs> an unidentified OSR game. I'll find that and I'll put the link in the in the description. But they. What they took the view of is like you have the main character, um, and then if you had more players, you you jiggled about with the 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 opposition. They did it that way. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So, uh, um, yeah, but there was lots of, lots of rules to sort of make sure that you pay attention to <laughs> your your singular ca character um, a bit more than you do would do in in, in an, a typical ensemble sort of RPG. Mm. I, I I would I'm very tempted to pick up my copy of Beowulf and. And, and and stick Watch it up, it um, but uh, it wouldn't do it justice. Um, oh, it's dear. a lovely art book. Every, every page is full color. I'll do oh, it. Oh, that, you yes, can do it. it. There we go. Look at that. See, Look, that's your job. Spot you have your, your, yeah. It's your game, <laughs> and it's all Just full color. It's all handiwork. Dot games. You can see all that. Yeah. that sort there's of, yeah. miniatures. There's battle yeah. mats. It's there's an that's art book now, stuff. which I obviously yeah, picked yeah, up, yeah. Um, and that was John's sort of first thing. Uh, and it's all, as I say, fifth edition. Um, yeah. And uh, why did why did you do it fifth edition? Why didn't you just go? Oh, here's a very clever. Well, um, the team that I had on hand, we had worked on Adventures in Middle Earth, which right. was the the fifth edition adaptation of the One Ring, and we just really enjoyed it. It's, it's a weird thing. I've, there's a blog post somewhere I say about this because people ask this question a lot. Um, I really like fifth edition. I just like yeah, it. I genuinely yeah. think it's good. Um, and I know people are sort of fed up of hearing about it. That That is an understandable gripe at the moment on sort of RPG Twitter that it's sort of everywhere and it's ubiquitous and it's it's had this enormous sort of upsurge of, it, of interest and so on and people are a bit fed up of it. But I just think it's a really good game. And it it I think with 5th edition, they managed to encapsulate a lot of really the things I think of as fondly about D&D &D, um, without a lot of the nonsense it's quite yeah. streamlined yeah um, it's you know it's got the a lot of the charm of the sort of red box D, D era um with with a bit more to it and there's such, i just think some really smart rules inspiration i love all that i love um conditions i think are really smart um yeah there's a lot of good stuff in there i think and i, I enjoy I've, I've, enjoyed designing for it i've kind of i've only dipped my toe um mm. i'm over deep percentile um because of open quest and yeah and if I don't work on open quest and other things like monkey, uh, then then these they will fade away. So yeah, I've not yeah. really had chance to. Uh, but I play. I picked it up. I've played it at, um, one day as one shots at, uh, at um, in installed game 
um, mm -hmm. meetups. I've played it with my son. I played the um, oh the second starter box, which is oh yeah 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 um, yeah the essentials the essentials yeah um, which was very clever. Um, and it, we just I kind of bumbled my way through. It does yeah I, I like the second one a lot more than the first one. I have to say yeah. I think the first one missed a trick really, but it I works very well. Um, I was kind of like rather than it me sort of kind of struggling with this new edition of D and D. I was it was taking it. It was very much formatted as a open world computer right. game, and I was coming hot off playing loads of Fallout Four mm. and and Borderlands and that sort of nonsense on the PC. And my son, you know, he's got his, his he's a Switch person, so right, yeah. we we kind of did it like that. You find yourself nice. in the t the town center. Look, there's the mission. But oh, sorry, the, the notice board. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, off we go, and it worked very well from that. And I kind of accidentally picked up the rules as I went along. Oh, I remember this from DD. Are we playing DD? Oh, yes, there's a dragon in it <laughs> lurking somewhere in the background. And it's going to roll up, turn up if I have all, all the 20 on my D20 encounters things. So it's, uh, it's a funny thing as well, because I'm certainly not, I mean, this sort of segues into the, the thing I'm working on at the moment. Um, I'm not sort of on the, the cheerleading squad for 5e. I suppose I am from the things I've said in that. I play all sorts of games and I like mm. all sorts of games. And I think I sort of the internet discourse around 5e seems to be your sort of for or against it. I think it's our game, you know, among I, many games. I, I'd like it, but it's not the only game in town by any manner of means. My, my, my take on it is mm. I, when I went to, when it first came out and it'd been out in a couple of years and I still hadn't got hold of it and grok grokked it. I was, I think I was doing Crips and things. I was really mm. into the um, old school Renaissance and caught up with that. So which was very much sort of like, well, well, Wizards have just nicked loads of eye ideas. Yeah, right. And it's not all that good. And I was just like, well, I'm busy selling grips and things to that yeah. mob. So I, 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 when I've got time, um, I'll look into it. But the, the I forget who, the, the, the RPG seller in Traveling Man Manchester at the time mm. said, I said, what do you think of it? He says, it's a really good game. I've, I've got mm. a couple of years of that, and it will always be my first love. So he'd obviously got into RPGs via the fifth edition there, right, okay. there was this huge there's this huge one which i will never underestimate for many years i i picked up rpgs in the 80s um and a lot of my peer group and we for a lot of years though we went we took it with a student student land and a few people would come on in the 90s mm -hmm. for, for um for playing in games and got into that way and then we went to these conventions and um, it was like, where's all the new people? Where's all the students? You know, all those people like us had loads of time at university. Yeah. Why aren't they coming along? All they're into card games, all they're into video games. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then for me, it was a, even 3.5 even that was a great leap forward. Um, where's the new people? This is meant to get all the new permits in. Mm -hmm. oh, it's too complicated. It's too little small <laughs> text. Um, and then so there was this feeling that however clever our games became as we started publishing our own material, that it's a dying art. Right. They're going to be in computer games, computer. Mm -hmm. And then fifth edition. Oh, they're doing fifth edition. They're flogging a dead horse. And then, boom. Suddenly, See, his, the, it, the new people there, it's a game it's, for it all It was really ages. interesting that you, you would hear repeatedly that everything was going towards computer games and everything was going to be on computers. And I don't, I don't know how well it was predicted that people just got a bit fed up of being yeah. in front of a screen yeah. and actually went the other way, you know, with the board game sort of, I think the board game boom kind of led it. That's like Going to you, Expo, you know, whoa! Yeah, you can do stuff that that has some of the things that you've enjoyed in computer games, but actually is is much more sociable. I mean, obviously, then then curiously, it's gone back the other way with, with lockdowns and, and playing on virtual tabletops and so on but i think that's much more of a, a matter of expediency and then taking the good out of it that you can play with anyone around the world and that's really mm. good you know and cool but um yeah it's it's a funny it's funny how that went that it was because there was a time before 5e where it was all sort of it is dying you know and and the, the debates around how good 4e was or wasn't really was sort of i felt a bit overshadowed by yeah but this is just a, a dying art in general um, and that turned out not to be the case. I mean, I think there's a lot of sort of lightning and bottle stuff that happened. Uh, yeah. And people yeah. It's, it's hard. I, I don't think about it. Why? It's, yeah. it's, it's magic to me. It's it. And I, and I should perhaps as a, as somebody 
you know, I should perhaps critically look at this, my fifth edition. And then I think, no, it, let's, let's do that once we're further down the road. Let's, let's yeah. just beard pulling historians. Hello, I'm making my money out of being a game historian um, at a uni some university as a retirement job. But now I'm just caught up with writing games and stuff and thinking, oh, if I do a fifth edition game thing, so... Which I, I'm, 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 I've got one scenario out for fifth edition, and I've got a trio of scenarios coming out. Oh, bit, cool. bit of a plug, bit of a plug. And John, yeah, yeah. John and his design studio, how do what games did the covers? These lovely nice. background covers. I um, really look forward to reading your five E stuff. Actually, yeah, I mean, that's, I, it's funny talking about getting stuff done because that that's another big reason we used five E was because we knew we could and that we would be able to to get something done if we went 5e mm. whereas i mean a lot a few people have said to me oh i wish you know i'd love to pick up beowulf but it's 5e and i won't touch that and i'm like yeah okay that's fine i mean i, I think sometimes it, it depends who i'm speaking to sometimes people i i think want a bigger reaction from me than than they actually get on that score because i'm like okay yeah you know yeah. that's fine i'm not <laughs> I don't, you know i'm not going to try and convince you to to play something you don't want to play well i, I uh, get that a lot with open quests if, if yeah. I, why should i play your version of D percentile games when I've got RuneQuest, Mifras, yeah. um, Del Delta Green's now D percentile, all these other, other games taking up my time. Yeah. Um, and it's fairly immersive and oh, it can be for D percentile. I'm just like, well, good. Just play yes, what you like. Well, done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I would buy it to just like rob ideas off it for the other games. <laughs> I you can never have too many, can you? You know, you yeah. do, there's always something good, unless yeah. it's a truly appalling book, which you know yours aren't. There'll be something in there that's worth, you know. So, so to, what what you working on? So we did Beowulf is out in the yeah. wild. Um, it yeah. beat it. It beat the international shipping. <laughs> Yo, don't even go there. Yeah. Yeah. Goodness Remote. me, that was quite. Yeah, that was a trying time getting it across the Atlantic, and and it. See, poor Beowulf has never had its big release, if you know what I mean, because it. it was so difficult to get it across the Atlantic in the midst of COVID. So it's been a little bit, you know, I feel perhaps it's a little bit overlooked. I mean, that's not something I lie awake at night fretting about, but I think it, you know, it's a good game. Check it out. Anyway, it definitely uh, yeah. what, yeah, what, what, are we, what are we working on now? A state is our current thing, which is a really interesting, see, this is where, where the whole, you know, this gives the truth to what I'm saying about, you know, I like all kinds of different games. That's a forged in the dark game. So we're really into sort of indie territory there. Um, and that that basically is the A State is is another classic Brit game this time yeah. from the early two thousands written by Malcolm Craig, um, and worked on by a sort of team of sort so, of so, so yeah so sorry well, when I used to go to Traveling Man back in the back in the, the 2000s, I can I can visualize it. I walk past Han Solo, remember <laughs> the Han Solo cut cut out in the shop. God, you know, he's taking me back now. I'm like, I, I don't know. I'm looking do, at the desk. But... Is, is, is Matt or John there to ask, yeah. ask to tell me where my, my latest Give RPG was hassle. there? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's on or, the boat. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. And then this, and turn, if I turn right, there's the RPG section there. Yeah. And sitting in there, um, they say, I've been I'm talking to Jim from um, Jim from Patriot Games in Sheffield. Oh, cool. And he yeah. said, he said, if you're doing cover designs, mm. you should really have lots of white. Because right. it's really, and it, and you might disagree with that. Um, I do mm. to a certain extent. Because um, I get like dirty to get, quick. We get dirty. You get, get close. Yeah, get close. It's like, oh, that looks interesting. Um, but it is eye catching. And yeah. this, it was, it, it was, it was a, pro, it was a eight by eleven. It wasn't like novelist. Mm. But I, I kind of. Get, but there it was a state, and it was this sort of half of profile of face of a state logo, and that was it. Yeah. And and people would go, cool. oh, it's a state. <laughs> and that's why I, I backed it. I, I've yeah, not ba backed really it because I know the volume of RPG stuff I buy for research and because we're fancy and swap mates on Kickstarter, I, it would be just like, like, bump, uh, and and it will turn up magically at some point and 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 into a pot, small pile of, of of stuff. But I bought it because so many people were like, yeah, the setting, the feel, the mood. Do you know what it really system. impressed me? And it, this is a funny one, actually, because I have this with a lot of people I've ended up working with. So um, the, the sort of creators of A-State, uh, Malcolm Craig, and, and the graphics were done by Paul Bourne, who now almost coincidentally works for me at Handiwork Games. And I worked with Paul. I brought Paul into um, Cubicle 7. Um, as, as, and he did layout on one ring and, and everything, basically, during the time we were there. Uh, and when I left, he decided he wanted to 
come to basically cutting a long story short mm. um a little while after i went he decided you know it'd been so marvelous working with me that he couldn't bear to be apart from me um so so he came to work with me at handling games correct correct me if i'm wrong a lot yeah. of your your group your circle of artists is it, i met them um when i went up to edinburgh for the yeah I should say the convention that I should be at with Mark to, to have a chat with John would be the um, oh is it convulsion compulsion, compulsion. compulsion. yeah up in uh, Edinburgh Student Union um, yeah. which is a uh, always fun one for an ex Leeds Leeds University lad like myself to see how the other <laughs> half lives yeah uh, it's like whoa this is so look nice this place is a beautiful building but look at the price of the beer yeah logic I never get drunk here before uh, and, and uh, yeah, it's sort of all based up in Edinburgh and, and yeah, sort of that circuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah those, yeah, Paul, Paul Bourne, um, we, we all sort of, co- Paul Bourne and Malcolm Craig are Falkirk, um, sort right. of born and bred. Um, Malcolm lives down south now. All um, oh, right. Yeah, he's not that far away from you, actually. He's, is he Huddersfield or Halifax? <laughs> hey, we're not <laughs> south. <laughs> That's not the south. <laughs> yeah, down south. Yeah. Right, stop it this now. Me. Stop yeah, this stop That's it. Turn Why it off. This is never going released. Yeah, <laughs> you southern it. They all look the same to me. You southerners. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, they're, they're they're from Falkirk way. But um, which of course, this is this is how we started talking about doing a second edition of A State. It's really good mm-hmm. A State. Um, and Gregor Hutton, who you might know from, uh, oh, yeah. you know, um, three sixteen. Um, oh, well, he ra- he ra- ran compulsion. Um, yes, my, he did. With, him and Phil. with my mate Phil Harris. Of course, you and you and Phil. Who I know from Leeds go uh, way back, don't you? Yeah, yeah. and it Phil was when, when his world. name when I saw looking into going compulsion. His name was as he was even before I went to the one I went the mm. first time. His name was done as the RPG track lead. Yeah, and I thought, I wonder if that's the same Phil Harris I know. Yeah, same Phil, surely. It, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, no, good, good people. Phil and Gregor both really nice. Um, but Gregor has suggested actually at one tabletop scotland that if we could convince because malcolm got really fed up with role-playing games that you know mm. we, we're, we're all aware there are, there are troublesome characters involved who maybe have limited degree of social skills and, and malcolm got really stalked by a couple of people who just would not leave him alone you know about his games i mean he'd he'd sort of sworn off it all he'd, he's written a bunch of other games cold city hot war really good stuff um and and gregor had come up with the, the idea that if we could convince malcolm that it was okay to do it um it would be a state would be just a brilliant fit for um forged in the dark rules and it really it sort of fits a missing piece into a state that it gives a real structure to play um it was the first game that that malcolm and paul had created and and like i think a lot of first attempts it, it had so much great stuff in it but it lacked a bit of focus it's this really amazing setting that's very hard to sort of sum up, it's a mixture of sort of Victorian, sort of Dickensian um, slums, but there's a lot of high technology and and what the, what are now called trusts in second edition that are sort of like corporations. We call them trusts because that's a better fit for the what we're doing. Um, and so there's this real mix and collision of cultures and, and levels of technology and so on. Um, and it's quite quite sort of politically motivated game in in the way sort of Dickens is politically motivated. Yeah. No. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, really, really great stuff. Very hard to sum up in. in it's in very British. That, yeah, that, that whole yeah. sort of like the the art and the, the game and the rest yeah, of it is indistinguishable. Simple. You have to have themes that are a bit sort of like rattling your brain. Yeah, um, it's, to, and to, that's, yeah, something really interesting in the the. I've been doing some editing the last couple of weeks on the book. Um, we're, we're really close to delivering the PDF right now, um, and it's really great to see the mixture of oh, because we recruited. Um, Morgan Davey, who was big in the, he ran the um, Ed, uh, Edinburgh Games Club called Walk for a long time. Morgan, he lived, he's he's from New Zealand, but he lived in in Edinburgh for a while. He's back in New Zealand now, but he's he's done the the main body of writing on the rules side of things, um, and it's really brilliant. To see, he's he's they've just absolutely nailed being really quite caring, and um, I'm trying I'm trying to avoid saying awake. But it's quite, yeah, we'll just say woke if we want. Why not? Um, it, it, it's quite an enlightened set of rules and, and, and the way it approaches quite difficult material when it's talking to sort of the GM. 
but then in world stuff is all really horrible yeah. <laughs> and it's always a challenge to do that and i just think they've absolutely nailed it oh nice one yeah and, you know because people worry about that stuff and these guys have oh. just just yeah nailed it to the yeah floor. well we're because we're, we're, our first couple of games were very much old school mm. um and the art direction was you know um very much old school we had we had a bit of criticism about boobies and right, okay. <laughs> an inappropriate yeah. boob plate yeah. armor. and it was a slow well we're just kind of copying a bit what um yeah. what was typical in the 70s you know yeah. the, the game games that the you know you know, first edition, first edition over the rest to come out, I would say it. <laughs> yeah. I had that. And also they had the one that was like one of my first um games and it was sort of you didn't know any better. And so yeah, there's that. And then I did crypt some things where I was very aware that's very dark. It's all grim dark mm -hmm. fantasy. It's all and it's based upon um sort of old sort of fight fantasy, very early books and the early sort of white dwarf scenarios. Things like the Lich Way, they don't put. Um, I'm trying to think. Irian, they don't pull any any punches. Mm -hmm. The nasty monsters. There's evil in the world. You know, people get murdered, raped, whatever. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And they and but to a modern audience, you know, you have to sort of say, you know, this is just a game, and you have to sort of look. You have to do a review of to say, should we really have this? Yeah, in a game. Yeah. You know, times, times have moved on a lot, haven't they? You know, and it's the same throughout society. My, really, you know? uh, and for British gaming as well and culture, mm. the I, I I follow a great series of book called um, Scarred for Life. Yes, yes. Yeah. And these are big, thick books where mm. the guys to do that. There's one for the seventies. There's two for the eighties, but they find old children's and young adults programs and comics. And there's a, there's a wonderful view of sweeties even. Um, <laughs> and and all these terrible horror influence stuff that they just did. Um, yeah, you know, I, I have a theory that in in the sort of seventies and early eighties in the UK there was because some of the sort of public information films and things children's mm. programs were really terrifying. I mean, proper terrifying. Yeah, and it's in part because there's this sort of perceived or, or remembered golden age where kids could go out, you know, at the break of dawn and play out you know on their own forever you know until the till the street lights came on then they came home and and nothing ever happened to except for the ones that were murdered you know um and and it's a sort of yeah forgotten golden age but you had to have those really horrific adverts like spirit of dark water and all this and and warning you against throwing your frisbee near the power lines oh that was my favorite you know, it's like, it's like it's frisbee ah, yeah, don't ah, get to it. yeah. <laughs> and then yeah but you're flinging your your fishing i'll line put a link the, in the description for, yeah. for people they'll do it for, to the videos on youtube but but kids had to you know they were left to fend for themselves it wasn't necessarily this sort of golden age of freedom that i mean i certainly enjoyed it as a kid but i don't know that it's necessarily right and and kids needed skills young it's you know, an to, interesting to one i think it. <laughs> i think as as brits um the whole grimdark thing is it's hard baked into the literature and yeah, and, yeah. and the slight we were talking, I was talking to my mate dr mitch my my pop, my dad's from Norfolk and he moved, he went to university, moved away. Mm. And he once said to me, well, if I'd stayed in North, it was I have a choice of going to tech college and learning about electrical engineering and all that and what I did, or losing a hand working right. in the fields in the in, in, in the yeah. uh, in the in the fields and with the, the the old agricultural machines and you know you, you forget there's no this and there's no health and safety laws. Yeah, you know, um, and it's uh, and but Grimdark, I think you know, it's it there in the literature, like Beowulf going back to Beowulf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is a yeah. you know, really dark tale yeah. of, of a, a man with a sword against a terrible <laughs> a, a, the forces of nature make manifest to this horrible. Um, and he kills the first body, and it, oh, it comes back, back worse in the form of his mum. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like real. Oh, ah, it's not get. You know that that whole scenario is not get good. Um, my fa um, Canterbury Tales. There's some crackers yeah. in there. Um, yeah. Well, that's all quite. Um, you know, fifteen certificate, isn't it? Canterbury yeah. Tales. You know. And uh, my my fa and 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 Shakespeare all over. Mm -hmm. Titus Andronicus. You oh, know God. things like yeah. <laughs> these God. tragedies. You know. Um, and my favorite was where well, I came across this. 
was I touched briefly when I was being taught medieval history at school, mm. but the idea of mummers plays. Yeah. yeah. You know, these traveling players would go around the land along with the, along with the, uh, the bards whose their jobs were to tell people the news and the mummers plays would um, mainly at Christmas and festivals would do religious and other plays. And, uh, and sometimes also they were the public announcement, <laughs> uh, morality plays of the day as well. And we got, we were castle riding in, in Norfolk again, the land of my ancestors. Mm. Um, uh, and this big, wonderful Northern, uh, Norman castle, square keep. And there were some reenactors there, a whole company of them. I think they called the Golden Lion Company. Yeah. Um, and they, after a day of doing sword fighting and showing how bows worked and everything, they put on one of these plays. And we sat on the opposite of the moat, there on the other side. And they quite, in front of us, uh, an all ages crowd, no, no certificate, played out this tale of a young knight who recently got married, has a big castle, right. and and he's called off to go to the crusade, as you were. Your knight, you expected to go to the Holy Land and, and fight in the crusades. Right. While he's off in the crusades, um, the, the, the landloader next to him, um, who's a big wealthy guy, a bit considerably older, who has his son of his own age, goes, right, son, um, young knight is lord of uh, neighbouring lands, is, is away at crusades. Go and woo his wife. Get, get in there. And... and 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 he was this this woman mm. successfully who's who's lonely and, and implied is a slightly wicked and and, and mm. lacking in character, um, of course. And mm. and and they fall into bed and the rest of it. And th yeah. this has all been told out in front of my my small many small children. <laughs> so when the the young lord returns from the crusades, um, the they fall, he announces this to his wife. He sends her love. I've been away from you for so many years, so she knows he's coming back. So does the, her lover. Her lover meets this guy in the middle of nowhere on the way back from London, the port, and, and this sort of, oh, hello, John. Hello. Smack. Kills him <laughs> and, and dumps his body in some lonely nice. ditch, ditch in the middle of nowhere. And at this point, everyone goes, <gasps> and then, and then the it gets worse bit, because uh, as these tales always do, go back to um, Beowulf. Mm. Um, she, he goes home um, and they leave it for a couple of years and they declare the knight. He's obviously got killed on the way back right. from the crusade. He marries the widow and his dad accumulates the lands. And that whole tale of, of I don't know, of early capitalism and murder and, 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 and adultery was played out all ages. But that sort of thing was. Yeah, that's just you know, like, yeah. I mean, we used to have, I grew up in Wiltshire. And there was like you know literally mama's plays. There was the there was still they were still a thing, you know. And I mean, sort of much more. Uh, yeah, obviously we had TV, right? <laughs> it wasn't. It was a it was a sort of throwback thing, you know, a sort of curiosity. But yeah, you know, you all these sort of characters, you know, St George and all those sort of traditional well, characters. Punch and Judy shows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that's yeah, another I mean, one. But again, unsophisticated, that unreconstructed one... sort of stuff. Yeah, that that that's just wrong on so many modern values oh, and of of of, uh, of inclusiveness and uh, PCness and yeah, well, you're yeah, not battering people. Yeah, and, yeah, domestic violence. Yes, and, and, quite, yeah, yeah, this is you know. So that's you know, so anyway, that's sort of, and it's it's interesting now that so we still want to tell those tales mm. or variants of. Yeah, but you have to put a big cultural. Um, big sort of safe, safety guards. I've just been yep. writing them um, for, I'm doing a cyberpunk game at the moment called Reboot the Future. Um, cyberpunk, we cheerfully, <laughs> a wonderful hedonistic sort of bomb of drugs and mm. technology and gone mad and, and sanity and, you know, but you have to put safety guards there, especially where, you, you, I don't know how much, how much race they uh, being forged in the dark. There's a mm. lot of that generated by the group. Yes, yeah, very much. You have so, so you have very to, much yeah, so. yeah, uh, and so, uh, yeah, yeah. It makes sense to agree your sort of parameters before you start, and and that's okay. I think I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good. I, I do because you know. coming up through the hobby, there's there's um, there's, there's numerous I uh, playing one shots. I well after I met you in Leeds mm. um, for many years, my only outlet for role playing was conventions. So I yep. heavily went and some of the things that happened there. Um, 
Yeah, because do you know what? In in microcosm, I've played some convention games. I haven't played a lot of games at conventions. It doesn't sort of really suit me so much. But um, where you end up playing a game that just like I don't like this kind of game, and maybe not because of sort of offensive content, what have you, but it's just not the way I want to play the game. Like mm -hmm. I remember there's one famous game, and I don't, I don't the people that that ran it are still around. Um, so I don't want to sort of it's more yeah. about my taste than anything else. But the whole scenario relied on the GM sort of cheating the players as to what they're actually seeing. And to me, that is not the kind of game I want to play because, you know, that's it's too sort of simplistic and too antagonistic between players and GM where it's like, ha ha ha, you thought it was this, but actually it was that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, but bait and switch, but baiting and switching what you told us we saw. I don't know. I just I found it really tiresome, and I wanted my four hours back, and 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 just off the basis of that sort of entertainment, so a very facile kind of um, subjective view of what kind of entertainment I want. It's not a great leap to also go from that to well, what sort of subject matter are we comfortable including? And you don't want to surprise people with something that that could be, you know, just a difficult subject for them. I mean, I, I also think you know you see a few people who are very anti safety rules and stuff like well good for you that you've not encountered anything that would really upset you as part of the game i mean i've certainly had moments in life where we've had tough times you know that i would not have wanted that in my entertainment media stuff that's gone on you know yeah no it, to go into you know because for the same reasons it's a bit oh god it's a bit of sensitivity isn't it is it so hard no i i, I kind of worked my way right through this one um, mm. And it was basically, I, I came to the realisation um, once I made my games a lot more safer. I, I kind of, Steve Emmer, your mate Steve yeah. Emmer from Drummer, he said, and he this was coming from the LARP world where you have yeah. large crowds of people running about. And he said, you've got to make sure that your game is entertaining. Yeah. Your job. And that was the big thing, taking off the Viking hat of, and, and even if the players are trying to say, we're here, because you're so clever at this, you know, you know Glam for better than us, you run Run Quest. It's like, no, you've got to learn the rules as well. You've got to, because I'm going to bail the game around you, so you have fun. Yeah. And then for realising that, I think that my big realisation, when I kind of sat, when suddenly the X card and all that appeared upon these shores yeah. because of some, what happened in America, and, and it spread like wildfire, and people think, ooh. And it, it was tempted to say, well, that sort of thing never happens. And then you found out actually, yes, it does. Yeah, it does. I, uh, if you happen. go back mark through my history, finding up yeah. moments and thinking, actually, that person no longer comes to my games. Right. Is it because I've offended them without knowing? If we had a next card in place, I would know that I crossed a line. I, I know from it's interesting you mentioned Steve and live action role play because I spent years live action role playing with Steve. And I can think back to times at, at LRP games where there were things that were not okay. I don't, I don't mean anything, you know, desperately upsetting, but there were times I was genuinely uncomfortable with where the subject matter went. And I wish there had been a better framework in hindsight. I mean, we were very young at the time. Mm. I wish there'd been a better framework to be able to go, you know, to sort of put your hand up and go, I'm really not comfortable with this. There was a whole disagreement around. There was a beauty contest in one LRP game. And I had said, I'm not comfortable with this. And I was told at the time, but the, the women involved are comfortable, so you just shut up, um, which was, you know, and uh, a lot of personality involved, and I'm probably not <laughs> giving a very fair assessment, and I'm still pals with the people involved. Yeah, yeah. But but there was no sort of framework for me to respect. But as a man, I'm being put into a role that I don't want to take part in. Yeah. And and I wish there just, just, you know, been a better way to talk about it, which there is now, you know. Good. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and that's uh, because I realised... I, I put safety tools in my game as well mm. as as well as player centered. Make sure you're having a fun time, whether my NPCs or my clever idea. It's yeah, all about yeah, the characters. Yeah. That, and I know I know Blades in the Dark is big on that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's and, really clever. Um, I have to say it's, you know. But I put the safety tools in, and I eventually ended up in, uh, one of my. It's a couple of years ago um, now because the pandemic. But face to face with a table full of a very diverse group. Yeah. Mm. Um, and yeah. I realised they all had such a fun time because, you know, and there were uncomfortable moments and they were able to sort of, we were able to be sensitive and everybody had a good, and we roared in laughter and we had everybody there from a beginner um, 
trans person, um, a Frenchman. Um, all all the types, beginner. Somebody, French, somebody, somebody trans, who is hard of hearing. Free. So, so yeah, yeah. And, and everybody was happy. Oh, that's um, and and it's and I just suddenly realised you have the safety tools, you have the player, and you have the player center stuff that, uh, yeah. that games do now, so everybody can ha- feel safe. And if because if they can't feel safe and they can't relax, and if they can't relax, they can't have fun. You know, you'll you'll if you just say that moment, you know, where you're uncomfortable in that game, it, you're uncomfortable, you're tense, you feel yeah. it physic, you know, and if you get people to relax, they open up. And they have fun, and they do that safely. You know, they know the rules, you know, and the way, and, and, you know, and the safety measures. I've just remembered a really unfortunate thing that I was on the wrong side of actually, and it was a playtest game of Spycraft with uh, Dave Salisbury of Fanboy Three was running it, and there was a core oh, misunderstanding. It was Steve was there playing, Dave was there, Mandy was there, and I don't know how. I don't really know who got the wrong end of the stick and I'd be quite happy to say it was me, right? I don't know. It's a long time ago. I don't remember. But we thought it was a sort of quite gritty espionage type of game, but that wasn't, that was not the case. It was supposed to be sort of knockabout Saturday morning cartoon stuff, but, but we didn't really know that. And a scene sort of unfolded in the game where my character ended up shooting a, a sort of almost like a child soldier and it really upset one of the other players that I did that. Yeah. And there was that gap that safety tools would have bridged that gap because we would have had a discussion about what sort of game it was before we played. And we didn't have, in my recollection, I mean, Dave yeah. might see this and be totally mad with me for presenting this as totally not what happened. And I was a total dick. Could have been. Don't know. Um, I'd like to think, I don't think I went in there with that, any kind of intention like that. I genuinely, I was doing it in good faith. I thought it was that kind of game. We were sort of, CIA agents in South America. Well, to me, that tells you what sort of game it is, right? Yeah. Um, but but that's a huge assumption. And yet again, just a discussion, sort of session zero. What people want from this? What don't you want from it? You know, and 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 that sort of age old thing. If you dump a load of typical role players with guns into a scenario, there ain't much they ain't gonna shoot. You know, if unless. <laughs> had a discussion about it and and yeah it was just and that again was totally tone and theme we had not had a discussion about what was expected and and you know by everyone there and, and we fell foul of it and i, regret I i've seen it in actually. games what, but, but uh, again not, not recently not in the last 10 years mm, yeah but um i think indie role playing has really made people assess yeah. what they're doing but i remember old games where convention games where you, i i you'd have two uh, two players who know each other from home with another couple and then perhaps some <laughs> one person who sometimes it was me in the yeah. middle um, and the two groups wouldn't talk to one another because yeah, yeah and they would be run, playing in different completely headspace headspace different yeah. games and the only thing they have perhaps in common is that they, they're perhaps playing a cyberpunk game and it's interesting that because the dynamic at the table can be quite powerful. And again, I sort of disbelieve that the, the people that disparage safety tools, I think that they're, they're being, I would argue there's, there's almost willful ignorance of the way interpersonal dynamics can work. That if you have a couple of players who are quite forceful and pushing their, what they want, and there hasn't been discussions about how it all wants to go, it's really hard to stop that train sometimes, even if you all know each other and even if you're all friends, it can be quite hard to go, wait, like, please stop. Because, yeah. oh, what's wrong with you? You know, In, in, in Monkey, just, just briefly, because yeah. I just we've yeah. twittered on about We're this way one. over time. And, all. Uh, yeah. and, and, <laughs> I, and I can hear it. movement downstairs. The kids are yeah. awake and yeah. they want feeding. Uh, in Monkey, because Monkey get, can get very excitable. Because if you right. remember Monkey, the TV series, yeah. the, the characters got excitable. And players get into the comedy and then and, and chatting mm. the banter. And it gets very calm. Oh, oh. And, 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 oh, I want to go. Oh, I want to go. Oh. Um, I give... It's usually my my lucky cat, one of these Chinese lucky oh, cats yeah, yeah, with a paw. Yeah. I give that's the spotlight. If you have the spotlight in any scene, you get to go first. Yeah. And most of the time, it's it's it doesn't have to be a big thing, but it helps the the quieter players. Yeah, right. They know it's that, and the and the and the louder ones know, and they help on. You know, and yeah. it's a really big seismic shift. Um, and it does it's a simple simple tool and play a social rule almost. And um, that's yeah, right. I think you get more out of a game that way. I think I'd like to think, you know. Well, you have it. You have. 
Yeah. You have it in board games. I think that's where yeah. it clicked with me. I, I was struggling because I noticed it was a problem. And um, I had young kids at the time. My pair mm. were like toddlers. And they were up to playing full board games, but they, they like playing games. And uh, it's orchard games. You do yeah, all yeah. early, early years games. And they do the trolley game. Right. And all the trolley game is doing is you have a trolley, an empty trolley. You've got a menu card of items. You've got a load of items turned face down. And it's when it's your turn, you turn one up. If it's on your card, you put it in your trolley. Right. Yeah. And that's all it is. And, and there's no strategy. There's no cleverness. <laughs> it's just you go around. Yeah. There's a bit of sort of like, ooh, and yeah, you get to put it back down face if it's not on your menu. So the other players are going, trying to see what you pull so that's the only strategy yeah but it's teaching the kids to do my turn yeah your turn my turn you know that basic and and respect that so (laughs) it's there you know so i i I must admit when i looked at some of the indie games um like um and certainly um powered by apocalypse that classic one they have play sheets um and they have moves Mm-hmm. Like, like board I thought where's that come from and I just thought well if, I, if it's for board games because mm-hmm. in board games you make you make a move yep. and you have and your play sheet tells you all the rules um, and that's and that's where you get in a board game so, yes another, it's a role playing game there's a sort of interesting power thing again isn't there that we come from a place maybe when you played in the 80s the more of the rule book you could memorise almost the more power you had at the table because you could sort of dominate proceedings if you had memorized the, the rules. And that, again, that's not really, I think maybe so, some, some of us came up that way and are still quite attached to that and quite liked it almost. Whereas I don't know that again, it's not necessarily getting the best out of your players at the table. If no. the sort I, of, I want the whole table roaring with laughter. Yeah. That sort of quality, the qualification to do well at this is you've me- memorized the book would discount a lot of people, including myself now. I always joke about my 5e games. They're like barely 5e. Because like some nights there's just, oh, can you be bothered doing combat? No. So we just don't do it. We just sort of narrate it or or, or do a few really fun. simple dice rolls to just get, because I can't, re- you know, it's tired. We're tired and old and can't remember things. A bit I, 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 well, this, this is fun. Um, yeah. I, I think that the age of the big thick book mm. is, is gone because it, Oh, I, I can't keep having that store of knowledge. I've also found with online gaming, I, um, I can't be doing with games that are in, information dense. Yeah. Uh, me and me and Galantha and, Rune, and RuneQuest fell out of favour doing that, uh, right. well and truly. And um, also an aware, increasing awareness, sort of like, that both my children are on autistic spectrum. They've got, okay, got yeah. diagnosis. Yeah. Um, one of them is about to be diagnosed for a condition called dyspraxia, which yeah, yeah. again is another. Yeah. Um, if you get over, and and I've had a couple of cases online where too much information, and I get very flustered. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, that's like the kids do. Well, they're your yeah, children, yeah. so they're yeah. probably <laughs> oh, here. And yeah. I know one of one, my, one of my granddad <laughs> certainly was probably. Yeah. yeah, looked at him, looked at Henry. Yeah, my granddad yeah. Yeah. Um, was autistic as well. So. There's this one of sort of, and I've spoken to other people with the online things that it's got to be a lot more straightforward, direct. If you're given data dumps, you give us a handout, which they then, you know, yeah. have a break, read, 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 read this quick page. Uh, I was finding that quite interesting because, um, as well, because uh, I used to work in computing mm. um, and, and I was adjacent to e learning people. Ah, okay. So they, and very early on, I had a friend who worked in, it, in the very ground floor of e-learning back in, back in the uh, mid, mid-90s. And they did studies that's on, on the screen. And this is, a, this is very relevant for any of you, you creators out there mm. who are producing stuff for PDF, for tablets, and to be read primarily on the computers, that you only take in 85% of right. the text. So yeah. this, is, this is from, uh, and this is from science, this is from engineering text, um, very dense, and also my career in, in web development. Um, although I did a lot more the technical stuff, the programming, uh, and we eventually did uh, get in um, English graduates to write the content um, yeah. because they could. They were taking large chunk, editing down large chunks of text 
and the right mm -hmm. general rule there is you write 25 percent less mm -hmm. than you would for um would for, write for a book for yep. for the printed page um so yeah there's there's all sorts of and so that's a whole that's a whole issue of usability so i'm sure yeah. we could talk about that um maybe one for another time maybe you know another we, come time, back yeah, we, yeah, have, we have, yeah, a, yeah. have a bit more of a theme show about yeah. about that sort of thing no, yeah it's an interesting one because it's funny you saying about your kids my youngest son ben is uh dyslexic mm -hmm. and it's really there's a lot to say there about some of the stuff we found with board games more than you know the role-playing games but um yeah yeah we yeah there's some funny stories there about things we go oh yeah <laughs> and again that sort of you, it, it throws into a cocktail that idea that sort of uh, priding yourself on how much of a book you can memorize and then being the king of the table comes out looking pretty weird. i i because i've had these you know issues possibly about knowing it for years it's really really annoys me especially during the 90s because the 90s was the time of the big thick rule book yeah and also splat books it was like everybody had looked to the chaosium RuneQuest model where you have a reasonable size book and you say, well, we could include the rules for high magic in this supplement, but we're not. That, that's going to be its own book and lots of it. It's going to be very exciting. And then you get a writer in America who's been paid per, by the cents by the hour and they'd write a big padded thing. You know, mm -hmm. there's lots, Maybe, lots of, yeah. um, and I used to, I was struggling then to kind of, I tend to skip read, you see, yeah. and get the essence of it uh so yeah and, and and then some of those writers they would turn around and say well actually i'm doing role-playing stuff and this is the end of it and i'll shut up <laughs> um i'll do i'll do i'm doing this to get into writing fantasy novels right yeah. and i was like well fuck off and write your fantasy novels <laughs> and just get on with it do the draft over there why are you producing it's something funny. that i can't Oh, get my head back. I was just thinking about when I sort of I had a big long fallow period where I didn't play role playing games for a long time in around about that period. And I wonder, you wonder how much was, oh, actually, I just bounced off that style of game, maybe, you know. And, yeah. And maybe I, that's I why, think... you know, five is really easy for me to play. And I like it because that, and I, and it's totally a flaw in a way. It's like, I don't have any time, I don't have any energy, but I can manage that. You know, and and uh, however, I mean, I've had some brilliant times, like we said, you know, when we played play tested bits and bobs of um, A State as a group, and when someone else is facilitating it, it's absolutely brilliant, and I love it. But I can't run it because my brain's not up to it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it is. It's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so, right. All sorts. I'm gonna run. So yeah, what, we need so to see doing people. A, a, yeah, just so A, a State is a. a, 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 a have you got your next? book lined up or what, you're well, what are we up to well we have got yeah the next thing after so a state we're finishing up the pdf right now that will should be with people in the next couple of weeks hopefully fingers crossed um bit of artwork to do is the main delay mm -hmm. on that and that's on me so you know i can carry the camp for that entirely after that we are going back to kickstart for beowulf doing uh, a book called the trials of the twin seas which uh, is right. all of our pdf adventures in one big book perhaps we'll expand them if, if we're lucky enough to fund we've got ideas for each of them to get another couple of pages in each one to and, and for those folk i, I noticed this mm. I've, I've done it myself you know you do an adventure book um, after the main book and for those folk who have not picked up the main book will there be a chance to get that as a yeah, yeah, level that will be in there as well because i think we're probably going to have to reprint the the beowulf rule book it's gonna it's gonna catch me out let me tell you i was like looking at the stock we've got and we print printed plenty of them and i'm like oh <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 open quest is pod um, yeah for accessibility so people can get hold of it and not yeah, worry yeah. about getting it an overpriced shipping version for me in here, blighting. <laughs> but I am kind of going, oh, am I going to do a second? And I think I've decided I'm going to do a second print run for yeah. my friendly digital printer down in London. Nice. Um, so that might be a Kickstarter in, in itself, but uh, we'll see. I've got lots of things on. Cool. But, yeah. It's all going on. Yeah, you've got big plans, haven't you? From what I gather, it's all yeah. going on. We're not, we're, go we're not going to talk about it here because I've no, got lots of arms in the fire as it is. Um, well, you never know what these things are. We get it a lot where I like to just really talk about what's immediately going to happen because we've got all sorts, you know, chugging away. And I don't when like I, Well, one thing when I said I was talking to my friend, um, John Oswell, who, who at the time was a freelance um, web developer, mm. and I was talk, watching, I was 
quick question to him about how freelance work more than the nuts and bolts of how you pay tax in the master yeah and he said that the best the biggest thing you have to do is make sure you got cl- uh, clients lining up to to do work for you and i said no not with what i'm going to do because i just come up with ideas and <laughs> Yeah, you know, I've got hundred and one. I've got hundred and one of those ideas. Oh, that's why that's why I play it. Um and it is just picking the winners. Um yeah. and, and occasionally I think that's one thing if you're thinking about doing your own scanning company, um, uh, is to um be aware that sometimes some things just don't sell. And that's a yeah. bit shitter when it does. Um, and you just have to kind of quietly move on. Um and, and get and perhaps sometimes and sometimes I found as well for many years I I did open quest and I, it wasn't the funniest thing in my portfolio and I was a bit resentful but I was a steady seller and I had to support it. That's yeah. not the case now. Now I've got lots of fun things. Oh yes, the funds we're going to have in that development. Okay, nice right, one. lovely. So I shall leave you all. To, um, it's been lovely speaking to you, John. Um, yeah, you likewise. And uh, let's let's wrap this one up. Okay, until Brilliant. next time. Speak to you soon.